Our gospel reading this morning from Mark's gospel reads like a, a Shakespearean drama with political intrigue and conniving murder at the center of it. It's not what we're used to hearing from the gospels. It's a little uncomfortable, in fact. A, a beheading, really, on a beautiful Sunday morning? There are children present. No better way to turn us off than that, preacher. However, as we heard last week, things were getting pretty tense for Jesus. His message and its impact upon the region were beginning to ruffle feathers. He was rejected, if you remember, in his hometown. And immediately following that passage, we get this detailed story of John the Baptist's demise at the hands of Herod Antipas and the murderous Herodias and her easily manipulated daughter. Why this story? Why now in the story of Jesus? Well, it's as if Mark the storyteller wants his readers to know that the rejection that Jesus experienced in his hometown was only the beginning. It's a little bit of foreshadowing. It's as if he wants to give us an inside peek that the gospel at its heart is something which bumps up against the realities of life and the dynamics of, of power and the violence that sits at the center of that power. Something we witness in the news regularly and again yesterday with the events in Pennsylvania. Trouble is deepening. Things are getting more and more politically charged in Jesus' world by the day. And God's righteous people are running into the hard-won power of the Roman Empire. And the empire is getting nervous. And the righteous are getting dead. John the Baptist is in prison not only because he's the one preparing the way for the Messiah, but because with that role comes the job of telling the empire the truth about itself. And so he does this as a prophet. He not only criticizes Herod's private life in public, calling him out on his moral failings, namely taking his living brother's wife for himself, he is continually proclaiming that the kingdom of God is drawing near and that all other kingdoms will fail and will fall ultimately. Mark tells us that Herod is perplexed when he hears John. In fact, Mark tells us Herod liked listening to John. He liked hearing what he had to say. He just ends up siding with saving face in front of his dinner guests than with whatever it was about John that attracted him to his message. Herod is perplexed because the truth, it has a way of doing that. It's the same perplexity that will confuse the powers that be when it's Jesus' own turn to bump into the hard-won power of the empire. In fact, so much so that Pilate and Herod become friends as their acrimony and their animosity find the same home squarely aimed at Jesus and at the kingdom that he inaugurates in the world. Ultimately, the threat of this kingdom overrides their perplexity and their wonder, and they end up reverting to what they know how to do, what they think works. And so they kill to silence, they do it to intimidate it, and they do it to win. John the Baptist's end is fitting, biblically speaking insofar as John is a prophet, and biblically the price of being a prophet is usually this. But it is fitting too because John's ministry is to prepare the way of this Lord, to witness to the one who is coming after him, baptizing not only with water but with the power of the Holy Spirit. Here in his death, like in his ministry, he is preaching and teaching. John is preparing the way of the Lord. He's preparing the way of the cross, the way of suffering love. 
the way of this powerful weakness of Jesus. Here in his martyreo in the Greek, the word we get for martyrdom is witness. Here in his witness, he is preparing for the way, for the truth, and for the life. It is the way in whose wake many will follow, whom the prayer book calls the glorious company of the apostles, the goodly fellowship of the prophets, and the noble army of martyrs, the holy church throughout all the world, following in the wake of this way. Mark, the gospel writer, is writing to a community that has either just experienced the fall of Jerusalem or is living in anticipation, in, in anticipation that such a fall is imminent, that it's coming any day. Of all the Gospels, Mark wants to tell us that following Jesus, being a disciple of this Lord, means walking a path that is radical and dangerous, but ultimately righteous, true, and good. The activity, the, the witness and work of the body of Christ ought to confuse the powers that be, ought to perplex the well-worn ways of violence in this world, the well-worn ways of oppression and privilege. There is always the danger in church to think that if you're on God's side, if you're playing for team church, then everything will work out for you. You'll be healthy, you'll be wealthy, you'll be prosperous. God's got your back because you've got God's back. Well, not if you follow in the path of the baptizer. Not if you walk in the way of Jesus Christ. We need to be honest with ourselves, with the world around us. This world is locked in seemingly endless cycles of violence and death and destruction everywhere. We seem to be decided and determined to chase each other to the lowest rung of our humanity, to consistently fail and to, to swallow each other up and our natural world and our voracious appetite for power, for, for more, for status, for whatever we want. We all participate in Herod's world because it's the same world. And something has to give. Something needs to break through these self-destructive ways of ours. Something has to tell us the truth about ourselves, the truth about our empires. Something has to tell a better story of who we are, why we're here, and what's true, and what's good, and what's beautiful. Well, thanks be to God that we can name this something this morning. This something is what we celebrate in word and sacrament here this morning. This something is the love of God born out for the world in Jesus Christ. This something, He is for you, He is for me. It is Him, the servant of all, who has told the world the truth about itself, has told me the truth about myself and tells you the truth about yourself, that you are free of whatever binds you to the cycle of death and destruction, that you are in fact a beloved child of God who is called to the risky ways of holy love in a world that needs us to risk it. Because of Jesus, the cycle of death and destruction, it's, it's broken, it's nullified. The sting of it is gone because of the gospel. The end of the story is not simply being laid in a tomb, but one finally of resurrection, of restoration, of the victory of Jesus, who declares to us this morning, Behold, I make all things new. May we not only be perplexed by this truth, may we be called 
transformed and, and sent out into this world witnessing, witnessing to this love, this suffering love of God in Jesus Christ. Thanks be to God. Amen.